our scripture reading this morning is our sermon text in Acts 14. Acts 14 is the conclusion of the first missionary journey of Paul and Barnabas. And I'll read the entire chapter this morning. At Iconium, Paul and Barnabas went as usual into the Jewish synagogue. There they spoke so effectively that a great number of Jews and Gentiles believed. But the Jews who refused to believe stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. So Paul and Barnabas spent considerable time there speaking boldly for the Lord, who confirmed the message of His grace by enabling them to do miraculous signs and wonders. The people of the city were divided. Some sided with the Jews, others with the apostles. There was a plot afoot among the Gentiles and Jews, together with their leaders, to mistreat them and stone them. But they found out about it and fled to the Lyconian cities of Lystra and Derbe and to the surrounding country where they continued to preach the good news. In Lystra there sat a man crippled in his feet who was lame from birth and had never walked. He listened to Paul as he was speaking. Paul looked directly at him, saw that he had faith to be healed, and called out, Stand up on your feet. At that, the man jumped up and began to walk. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they shouted in the Lyconian language, The gods have come down to us in human form. Barnabas they called Zeus, and Paul they called Hermes because he was the chief speaker. The priest of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the city, brought bulls and wreaths to the city gates because he and the crowds wanted to offer sacrifices to them. But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of this, they tore their robes and rushed out into the crowd shouting, Men, why are you doing this? We too are only men human like you. We are bringing you good news, telling you to turn from these worthless things to the living God, who made heaven and earth and sea and everything in them. In the past, he let all nations go their own way, yet he has not left himself without testimony. He has shown kindness by giving you rain from heaven and crops in their seasons. He provides you with plenty of food and fills your heart with joy. Even with these words, they had difficulty keeping the crowd from sacrificing to them. Then some Jews came from Antioch and Iconium and won the crowd over. They stoned Paul and dragged him outside the city thinking he was dead. But after the disciples had gathered around him, he got up and went back into the city. The next day, he and Barnabas left for Derbe. They preached the good news in that city and won a large number of disciples. Then they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true to the faith. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God, they said. Paul and Barnabas appointed elders for them in each church and with prayer and fasting committed them to the Lord in whom they had put their trust. After going through Pisidia, they came into Pamphylia, and when they had preached the word in Perga, they went down to Atalia. From Atalia, they sailed back to Antioch, where they had been committed to the grace of God for the work they had now completed. On arriving there, they gathered the church together and reported all God had done through them and how he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. And they stayed there a long time with the disciples. All the stories of the Bible can be put into two different groups. In the Bible, you have the record of those who love, worship, and live for the true God, Jehovah, the creator of all things. And then there is the record of those who love, worship, and live for idols or false gods. It never ceases to amaze me how so many Christians in our day think it to be automatically, without question, a great thing that polls repeatedly show most Americans believe in God. There are very few atheists out there in our day, although their influence is strong. By far, there are many more people who believe God exists than those who do not. But herein lies the problem. What do all these people mean when they say the word God? Hardly anyone stops to ask that question, which is really a testament to how critical thinking in our day has gone the way of the horse and buggy. It's completely out of style. The unspoken assumption of our day is that all those who believe in God are really at bottom on the same page. They might call this God different names such as Jesus, Allah, Buddha, the man upstairs, the creator, the prime mover or the higher power or some cosmic force. But they really believe at bottom what we're really talking about is ultimately the same thing. 
Today, many Christians hear the word God and are naively comforted as if everyone is saying the same thing. Hence, you have our president and every president before him invoking the name of God in all of their speeches and all of the different addresses that they give to the people. And yet, they will not stop for one second or anywhere in public explain which God they're talking about, who they're actually referring to when they use that word. I listen to public pronouncements of the word God in our culture with a severe skepticism. Uh, Think about on your dollar bills what you see in God we trust. And of course, that's a true statement, but it's very different probably than most American Christians recognize because Americans do trust in their gods and they have many of them. The truth of the biblical Christian faith is that God is too important to be used as a cultural, political, and emotional salve to feel good. And that's how the word God is being bandied about in our in our world. God bless America and all these different slogans that we hear on a daily basis. If you read the Bible, you will find there are lots of people who believe in God whose gods are false gods. That may sound blunt to you. It may sound exclusive, but it's really true. You know, it's interesting if you read the Bible and think about what's actually going on in Scripture, you'll find that the great danger that the Bible addresses is not atheism. In fact, the Bible says very little about atheism. The great danger that the Bible is always telling stories about, always correcting and always teaching about, is the many stories of worshiping false gods. That is the great danger. And we sometimes don't realize how the Bible scarcely mentions atheism. And atheism, of course, has been prevalent in our age with the ascendance of materialism and and evolution and various materialistic views of the world. But atheism is on its way out. It has never been a very dominant view in the history of the world. The Bible deals constantly with many different forms of idolatry, and the implications of that are enormous for anyone who takes the Bible seriously. Now, our text today contains an account of Paul and Barnabas dealing with those who certain believed in God. And so from this text in Acts 14, we can see that it's not enough to be religious. That's the great lesson that we can learn from this text. If it was enough for them just to be religious, there would be no reason for Paul and Barnabas to call them to repent of these worthless things and follow Jesus Christ. What was true in their day is also true in ours. Many in our day need to ask themselves an important question when they use the word God. When I say God, do I believe in the God of the Bible or do I believe in false gods? That's really the question that we should ask ourselves when we hear the word God bandied about in our culture. Do I honestly mean the one true God who reveals himself in Scripture, nature, and Jesus Christ, or do I believe in a false God and an idol? So let's go to our text and learn from Paul and Barnabas as they confronted the idolatry of their day. Acts 14, beginning in verse 1. At Iconium, Paul and Barnabas went as usual into the Jewish synagogue. There they spoke so effectively that a great number of Jews and Gentiles believed. But the Jews who refused to believe stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. So Paul and Barnabas spent considerable time there speaking boldly for the Lord, who confirmed the message of his grace by enabling them to do miraculous signs and wonders. The people of the city were divided. Some sided with the Jews, others with the apostles. There was a plot afoot among the Gentiles and Jews, together with their leaders, to mistreat them and stone them. Now, all these cities mentioned so far in Paul's journey were connected by a Roman highway called the Via Sebast. The towns of Iconium, Lystra, and Derby were farming towns. They were agricultural communities that laid before, on top of great plains before the mountains of that region of Galatia. And so we have here this introduction about this arrival of at Iconium. Following the typical pattern, Paul and Barnabas went into the Jewish synagogue first to proclaim the gospel. And we've seen how this pattern works its way over the various places that Paul and Barnabas go to. But notice in our text what the effect of their preaching was. A great number of both Jews and Gentiles believed in Jesus, yet the people in the city were divided. One of the results of Paul and Barnabas' arrival was a great division, the same kind of division which accompanies all true biblical preaching in our day. And those who believe the message of salvation through Jesus Christ are actually divided from those who reject the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the reason I mention that is because we're habituated in our culture to believe 
that division is a bad thing at all times. That's how our culture propagandizes us into thinking about the unity of each other as Americans, as Westerners, and everything else. While division can be a bad thing, if division occurs for the wrong reasons, the Bible clearly does not condemn division. It assumes division as a fact of life with the gospel. As the gospel goes out, you have this great division between those who believe and those who reject the gospel of Jesus Christ. People today show how far from the heart of the gospel they are when they put those United We Stand bumper stickers on cars. If you think about those stickers, how prevalent they are in our day, whenever I see them, I always am tempted to ask the driver the famous question by that famous Indian Tonto in the Lone Ranger shows. You know, what do you mean we, Kimosabi? What do we mean by those United We Stand stickers? Well, what exactly is it that we are unitedly standing for? Nobody stops to ask that question either. Nobody stops to explain what that means. They just put the bumper sticker on the car and wave the flag. So one of the gospel accounts overlooked by our united we stand flag waving culture is when Jesus said in Luke 12, Do you think I came to bring peace on the earth? No, I tell you, but division. So don't be fooled by the propaganda that we have all around us in our culture. The gospel really is about division in a true and profound sense. It brings division whenever it is preached and it separates those who believe from those who do not. Where there is no division, in fact, there is no gospel. And that's something we have to remember as we live in our modern United We Stand culture. Notice also in our text that the message of grace was confirmed by miraculous signs and wonders. I pointed this out a number of times so far in the book of Exodus, but this is another, another connection here in Acts to that parallel to the time period in Exodus. The book of Exodus was also a time of great miracles and wonders. Did those miracles cause everyone to believe in the truth of the gospel? Notice in our text here what's going on. You have miracles and wonders being performed by Paul and Barnabas, and yet even after those miracles and wonders take place, you have still those who refuse to believe. And the same was true back in the book of Exodus, because those people who came out of Egypt, those people saw all the miracles and wonders, signs that God had worked among them, and yet their bodies fell in the desert because they lacked faith. It seems to be a recurring pattern. Remember the the life and message that Jesus brought to the Jews of his day. He performed many miraculous signs, and yet they lacked faith. So when we see how the miraculous signs and wonders here work, it really confirms the faith in those who believe, and yet it hardens those who refuse to believe. The Spirit really must work in and with the evidence that God provides for the truth of Christianity before anyone believes in Jesus Christ. So let's continue in verse 6 in our text. But they found out about it and fled to the Lyconian cities of Lystra and Derbe and to the surrounding country where they continued to preach the good news. In Lystra there sat a man crippled in his feet who was lame from birth and had never walked. He listened to Paul as he was speaking. Paul looked directly at him saw that he had faith to be healed and called out, Stand up on your feet. At that, the man jumped up and began to walk. The Lyconian cities were in a different political region than the city at Iconium. And so once Paul and Barnabas had fled Iconium to the Lyconian cities of Lystra and Derbe, what they had really done was left the political jurisdiction of the leaders of Iconium. Notice that there is something different about Lystra than the cities Paul arrived in up to this point. You notice that there's no mention of a synagogue in Lystra? That's important detail because Lystra was a Roman colony where the Jews of that day had little influence, and so there probably wasn't a Jewish synagogue in the city of Lystra. That's important to connect to this miracle that we read about here with the healing of the cripple. Why do you think Luke would want to record the specifics of this healing. And notice how he goes into detail about it. The other miracles and signs he just throws out together as many miraculous signs and wonders, but this miracle we get to in the city of Lystra is actually very specifically lined out in exactly what happened. If you look carefully at this miracle, you will see that it is almost identical to the miracle performed by Peter and John upon the lame beggar in Jerusalem who sat at the temple gate beautiful. Do you remember that miracle right after Pentecost? when Peter preached the covenant gospel to the Jews. Well, notice the similarities here between what we read in Acts 14, beginning verse 8, to what we read back in Acts 3 with Peter and the lame beggar who sat at the gate beautiful. Luke says that this man was lame from birth. 
in Acts 14. Of course, that's how we get the in Acts 3, 2. He says, now a man crippled from birth was being carried to the temple gate. Notice how Luke writes that Paul looked directly at this man who listened to Paul. And of course, in Acts 3, 4, and 5, Peter looked directly at the beggar and told him to look and listen to him. Luke says in Acts 14, this crippled man was told to stand up just as Peter told the beggar of Acts 3 to stand up and walk. And of course, the result is very similar because this crippled man jumped to his feet as did the lame beggar back in Acts chapter 3 at the temple gate. Now, I think there's a subtle reason why Luke would want to record these particular details in the same manner as we have the recording of the healing of the lame beggar back in Acts 3. Luke expected the reader of Acts to make the connection of this healing by Paul to the healing Peter and John brought by God's power to the lame beggar. So we'll see it later in Acts 15. I think this is all laying groundwork for when we get to Acts 15 and the question of the Gentiles and how they relate to God. But we'll see later in Acts 15 how all these signs were interpreted by the early church. But suffice it to say that this was powerful evidence that the Gentile mission Paul engaged in was as legitimate as the Jewish mission from earlier in Acts. Remember back with Peter. It was proof that God called the Gentiles to salvation, which is what this healing symbolized allegorically. Back in Acts 3, the sermon was the joy of God's healing. And the, and the point I made with that account of the healing was it was symbolic of spiritual salvation. Of course, this healing also was symbolic of healing, true spiritual healing, but yet without requiring them to be a Jew. So there is no synagogue here. There is just Paul and Barnabas going out and preaching to the people. In Christ, there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. That's really what Luke would have been getting at with this healing particularly here and with the Jewish healing back in Acts 3. There's no difference. You have the healing of the lame beggar beginning in Acts 3 with a, with a Jewish mission and you have the healing of this lame person right here in Acts 14. There's no essential difference. Now, this is an important point to remember when we study other parts of Paul's teaching. Last week, I explained to you geographically where Paul and Barnabas are right now in this mission journey. They would actually be among the places that we would call Galatia. And these people that converted to Christ through the ministry of Paul and Barnabas would have been the Galatians that Paul wrote to in the letter to the Galatians. Now, turn with me to Galatians 3 and we'll see the connection here between the history that we have recorded in Acts and what Paul really drives home with Galatians chapter 3. And I want you to keep your finger here because we'll come back to Galatians 3 a little bit later uh, in this text as well. But Galatians 3, Paul writes, beginning in verse 1, You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by observing the law or by believing what you heard? Of course, that's what Paul and Barnabas came in. They came in declaring the truth of Jesus Christ and they heard the message and believed it and then these miracles and signs are worked among them. Are you so foolish after beginning with the Spirit? Are you now trying to attain your goal by human effort? Have you suffered so much for nothing if it really was for nothing? Does God give you His Spirit and work miracles among you because you observe the law or because you believe what you heard? So here Paul is referencing those same miracles that we read about particularly in Acts 14. So they received the Spirit when they believed Paul's message and this lame person was healed when he believed Paul's message and acted by faith, not when they kept the law. So here's a connection in this text of Acts 14 to lots of our Bible and how we understand God's salvation. Continuing in verse 11, When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they shouted in the Lyconian language, The gods have come down to us in human form. Barnabas they called Zeus, and Paul they called Hermes because he was the chief speaker. The priest of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the city, brought bulls and wreaths to the city gate because he and the crowds wanted to offer sacrifices to them. Now this account may sound humorous to you because Paul and Barnabas didn't catch on right away to what was going on. The crowds were shouting in their own language, the gods have come down to us in human form. And of course, Paul and Barnabas didn't know the language, so they're hearing this shouting and this, the wild getting together the crowd and they're not understanding exactly what's taking place. They called Barnabas Zeus, who was chief among the Olympian gods, and Paul they called Hermes because he did most of the speaking. 
Now, there was an ancient legend that Zeus and Hermes once came to this area looking for lodging and food. And after asking for hospitality at a thousand homes, they finally were taken in by a poor elderly couple who made them a great feast far beyond what they could afford. In response to this couple's kindness, the legend goes, they turned their hut into a great temple with a roof of gold and made them priests and priestesses. And then they went to those thousand homes where they went asking for hospitality and destroyed them. So this legend is in the background of what's going on here in our text in Acts 14. That's why the crowd was so eager to pay homage to Paul and Barnabas. They certainly didn't want anything bad to ever come of them once they knew how the Olympian gods had dealt with their forebears. And so they were very, very excited. Zeus and Hermes came back to them and they were going to make sure their sacrifice of choice bull and reeds and all their homage would make the gods happy. So the sacrifice here that they're talking about bringing to Paul and Barnabas was necessary to save them from the anger of the gods, Zeus and Hermes. And if you read Greek literature, if you read the classics, particularly books by Homer, you will find many examples where different people in these Greek tragedies, in these Greek stories, offer these bulls as sacrifice and they're doing it along the same lines that these people were doing it. They believe that they could gain something from the gods by offering them bulls and offering them the various sacrifices. They could make the gods happy with them and they could force the gods to favor them in all, in all the things that they did in the places they went. If you compare the records of the Greek pagan to the worship of the true God, it's a totally different kind of sacrifice because everybody knew that you were just doing the sacrifices in the pagan myths to placate the gods. There was no concept of relationship, so to speak, as we think of a covenant relationship with Jehovah God. There was just this simply desire to make the gods happy. They were all about earning or manipulating the gods' goodwill. Now, this may sound primitive to our modern ears, but it's a perfect example of what idolatry really is. Idolatry is, at bottom, when man relies on the works of their own hands for their salvation and ascribe to the creation the glory which rightly belongs only to God. Idolatry is relying upon the works of your own hands. And, of course, this is a very traditional form of ancient idolatry. And we can look at this, and people think of this as being... That's just sort of the old thing. We don't do that anymore. We don't sacrifice bulls anymore, so we don't have any idols. But if you look carefully at that pattern of relying upon the works of your own hands to save yourself, then you'll see that there is very much idolatry going on in our day. Idolatry is prevalent all around us. Even people who on the outside appear to be religious in every way are engaged in the same type of idolatry. The key here is to recognize the principle of sacrifice. Our culture doesn't concern itself with sacrificing bulls to appease the gods, but this same pattern of looking to the works of your own hands is prevalent in our day. Show me what people are willing to sacrifice for, and you will see what gods those people worship. The key here is the sacrifice concept. There are idols all over the place with sacrifice being offered on their altars. And I'll give you this rundown of an example of a list of common idols in our culture and how sacrifice plays a part in these various idols. And this is not obviously an exhaustive list. There there are many, many idols. But our culture's big idols are things like this. Education. Many people teach that they can save themselves by educating themselves. And of course, you understand how what big industry education is in our culture and you realize what people are sacrificing to in our culture. They're willing to go into debt for decades sometimes for student loans to get education to save themselves from poverty, save themselves from all these different backward and unenlightened times. Politics is a good example. People look at the great idol of our age, the state, to save them from every ill and every problem that might come up in life. People run to the government to save them or the military to save them and protect them from all danger. And their sacrifices, of course, to the government are great. It's interesting, the amount that we as a culture sacrifice to government, it far exceeds uh, many, many governments in the past. And by some estimates, most people will give to the government more than one half of all of their productive life. It's a great sacrifice because in our day it's a great idol. Or you can consider how money itself is an idol. 
how many in our culture judge themselves in terms of the connection they have with their money rather than the relationship they have with the one true God. And of course, people bow down and worship money. Jesus talked about the false god of mammon, the love of money. And of course, money is the work of our own hands. So you can see how this fits in with the idea of idolatry. But people are willing to sacrifice everything in their lives to make more money. They're willing to sacrifice their families. They're willing to sacrifice their values. They're willing to sacrifice their principles. Everything for more money. That's a very big idol in our day. Then you have sports, music, and entertainment as another big idol of our age. People are willing to make great sacrifices for the games or music they love. This is why entertainment in our day is such a big industry because there are such great sacrifices being willingly laid on the altar of sports, music, and entertainment. Then you have science, technology, and medicine as great idols in our day. Many place their hope in these things for comfort, security, and health. And what is this culture not willing to sacrifice for science, technology, and medicine? So when you look at this text, realize that idols are simply what people will sacrifice greatly for. It's really as simple as understanding sacrifice and you will understand idolatry. And when I go over the modern things that we have as modern idols, I don't want to leave out idols of the past because we've had many different idols through history One good example of an old idol, a few centuries ago, the big idol was the Holy Mother Church. Just six or seven, eight hundred years ago, you can think about how people tried to save themselves by the good works they performed for the church. And then they lived as if the church itself brought eternal life to mankind. And of course, what were those sacrifices to the institutional church that they were willing to give? They were willing to give all their money in cases. They were willing to give the church the inheritance of their property and everything else. This idea of idolatry is really not difficult to understand. Look at what the sacrifices are and you will see where the idols lay. Now, none of these things I will hasten to mention is evil in themselves. None of them are necessarily bad. Education is helpful. We all love education. We find it useful in our lives. Politics are necessary. So I'm not talking against these things completely. I'm saying... I'm not saying looking how, how people are looking to their salvation through them. Sports and music are given for our enjoyment. Science, technology, and medicine can be great benefits to mankind. And God-honoring churches can do much to foster the gospel. But all these things, if they are not to become idols, must remain under the lordship of Jesus Christ. Only God is due worship and praise, for he is the creator of all these things. And this is where it gets profound. Because if the Lord God is the creator of all these things, if he made the world in which we live, in which, and he's given to us the ability to make these advancements, then he is the one due all of our worship and homage for his gifts. And those who refuse to worship God only demonstrate that they are ungrateful to God for these very good things that he has blessed us with. So worship is a very important part of life from the Christian perspective and the gospel. Continue in verse 14. But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard this, they tore their clothes and rushed out into the crowd shouting, Men, why are you doing this? We too are only men, human, like you. We are bringing you good news, telling you to turn from these worthless things to the living God, who made heaven and earth and sea and everything in them. In the past, he let all nations go their own way. Yet he has not left himself without testimony. He has shown kindness by giving you rain from heaven and crops in their season. He provides you with plenty of food and fills your hearts with joy. Even with these words, they had difficulty keeping the crowd from sacrificing to them. While we may think of this account as sort of humorous in the background and the the pagan naive view of the world, Paul and Barnabas obviously did not find it such. They did not find it humorous that you had men who were willing to sacrifice uh, bulls and, and wreaths and pay homage to them as gods. Of course, they knew all about the accounts of idolatry in their history. They knew about the golden calf in the wilderness, the Baal and the astral worship of the people during the time of the judges and the kings. And then, of course, the stories about, the, about Solomon's foreign wives who brought foreign gods. So this was a horrific turn of events for Paul. You might look at this and say, well, it's not that big of a deal. Obviously, they aren't God. So what would it hurt for them to just go and sacrifice bulls and be done with it? 
Well, it is a big deal because they loved the Lord their God with all their hearts and with all their soul. They would not allow the glory that should be ascribed to God to be applied to themselves. And it was, again, because of the love that they have for Jehovah, the love that they have for their Savior, Jesus Christ. That was why they objected to the homage that the people offered. So notice their first step in confronting this idolatry was to object to it and refuse to participate in it. That's your first step in confronting idolatry. That's important to point out. Notice also that they did not use this newfound power over the people to build Christianity on the foundation of the people's traditional practice. You know, Some pragmatists would look at this text and say, you know, Paul and Barnabas really missed a golden opportunity here because if the people are going to look at them as Zeus and Hermes, think about the platform that they could have used to speak the gospel. Of course, they didn't do that. They could have possibly taken their pagan traditions and overlaid them with the gospel. It would have been possible for them to say, look, who you guys think of Zeus, I mean, you guys can go ahead and call him Zeus, but he's really God the Father. And they could have said about Hermes, well, Hermes, you guys think of him as Hermes, but actually it's Jesus Christ you should worship. No, they didn't do that. They stopped that practice in its tracks and they refused to participate in it and they refused to actually uh, profit from it. In fact, if you think about what happened later with Paul, they may have been more successful in protecting themselves if they had mixed their common practice with the teachings of Christianity, but they didn't mix these different things. They realized that they refused to participate and could not participate in the idolatry that they witnessed. Though we live in the modern world filled with idols, we dare not succumb to the idol worship that is prevalent around us if we love the God of the Bible. That's what it comes down to. And when you look at Christians and how they respond to idols, it all boils down to how much they love the God of the Bible. When that love grows cold, you will see God's people falling into idolatry. This is the story from the very beginning of the kingdom. When they cease loving the God who made them, the God who made the covenant with them, then you have this falling into idolatry. And Christians today have this seemingly natural talent for mixing the gospel of Jesus Christ with the idolatry of the age. It's almost like we naturally do it. And if you think about all the history of, of Israel, it is in a way natural that God's people fall into this. But you have those out there who believe that it is their Christian duty to support all institutions of education for education state. That's mixing this idol education with Christianity and using Christianity to serve that idol. People believe that the unquestioning support for the government and the president and the messianic welfare military state to be our Christian calling. And so you have this idea of mixing this idol the state with Christianity going on in our day. And people use Christianity to give the justice to support for that idol. Think about the entire industry of Christian contemporary music and athletic-based ministries in our day. They're very prevalent, especially on college campuses. Well, here's a good example of taking the idols of our age, the music, mix some Christianity in it, and presto, you have an idol-worshipping Christian, if there be such a thing. Or think about how the entertainment business and various management techniques now govern the methods of ministry and worship. You have mega churches, and of course you can't limit this to mega churches anymore because now small churches do it. What are they doing out there to get people in the doors? They're making Las Vegas-style entertainment, and they're aping the ways of the world, the ways of entertainment, and they're aping the business management practices of the world to run a church, running a church for the bottom line. Of course, this is mixing the idol of our age with the true religion of Scripture. Very dangerous, very dangerous thing to do. America loves its golden calves, the false gods of our age. Now, we have a sermon here in Acts 14, where Barnabas and Paul explain their reasons for stopping this worship. This abbreviated sermon of the apostles not only demonstrate, demonstrated the need to object to and refuse to participate in idolatry, it also highlights a godly response to idolatry. Look how they respond to the idolatry in a positive way. First of all, they call the people to listen to the good news they bring. Of course, this is good news, the gospel. Then they called them to turn from these worthless things to the living God who created all things. And then they speak of the great grace of God that gave them provision of everything they need, the food, the rain, and the crops in their season, the food 
that they need for their table and joy in their hearts. And it's interesting, this is actually covenant language because these are all blessings of the covenant here. But uh, this is a positive approach to idolatry and it makes sense. Why serve idols when you can serve the living God? You see how they're responding to it in a positive way? Why perpetuate futility when you can thank the gracious God who has blessed you with all good gifts? That's positive. It offers the people something better than what they were used to. And that's progress. That's the concept of progress. Offering someone better than what they are used to. We can all learn from this positive approach to idolatry. When we object to the idolatry that we see around us, we should be careful to emulate this positive method. It's not enough to say that we're opposed to idols because we need to present the positive alternative in the gospel of Jesus Christ. We can say, for example, that we are opposed to modern statism and the welfare state and the military religion of our day. And yet, we can also say, and we need to say, we are all for godly government that honors true justice and peace. And who can deny, it's interesting, in our day, who can deny that godly government wouldn't be better than the Leviathan state we all witness today? Everybody's complaining about government. Everybody's complaining about the state. Well, here we can say, look, godly government... We don't like idols. We refuse to worship idols. But godly government is better. It doesn't put the great burden on us as we all struggle under now. All the idols of our age can be confronted in a positive way. Education is done better when it's done Christianly. So our response to idols is not just negative. It's actually positive. We can also say money is more useful for God's kingdom than simply used for self. People understand that too. To give is better than to receive. And yet all the idolatry is based in the getting and the receiving and the working for my hands. But you find out money actually works better when you give it away, when you use it for a purpose, for a bigger purpose than yourself. Sports, music, and entertainment, even contemporary Christian music, are all better when done to the glory of God. So we can respond to these idols in a negative way, but we should never stop just approaching them from a negative perspective. The real problem is that in making all these things idols, our world simply throws itself into futility. There is no better life than the godly Christian life. There is no idol that compares to the grace and beauty of the true God. And that's the background here, why Paul and Barnabas would be so interested in stopping them from their futile ways and presenting the gospel to them. Verse 19, Then some Jews came from Antioch and Iconium and won the crowd over. They stoned Paul and dragged him outside the city, thinking he was dead. But after the disciples had gathered around him, he got up and went back into the city. The next day, he and Barnabas left for Derby. Paul didn't pick the easy way out when he stood for the worship of the one true God alone. If he had gone along with the pagan beliefs and practices of the people, he would, of course, have been safe from any injury. But once he directed the people to worship Jehovah God alone, he was in danger because that just took his security away. That can happen to people who stand against idolatry. Sometimes standing against idolatry is a dangerous calling. And you can read about all these stories in the Bible. They will, they will show you how the prophets stood against idolatry and how it was really a dangerous profession because all the prophets ended up getting killed. In this case, it resulted in the stoning of Paul. And there's something really interesting going on in our text here because Paul's experience here is much like the experience of Jesus because Jesus also came to bring healing. He came to stop the people from their idol worship and just as the apostles did here with these people and yet what happened to Jesus? He stood for God's glory and the brightness of God's kingdom yet the chief priests and the elders won the crowds over and caused Jesus also to be crucified. So what you have here in the experience of Paul stoning is a demonstration of the crucifixion of Jesus before the eyes of the Galatians. I don't want to get too carried away with this because pictures and symbolism in the Bible can be misused and abused. But do you see how this account of Paul demonstrates exactly what happened to Jesus? Paul came to bring the good news to the people. He also was rejected by the people. The crowds rose up against him and stoned him. Remember back in the story of the crucifixion, you have the chief priests and the elders winning the crowds over. Well, you have the exact same language going on here with these men that come from Iconium and the other cities winning the crowd over and causing the stoning of Paul. Notice Paul was carried outside the city 
as Jesus was as well, and left for dead. And then you have the idea of Paul rising up again as the disciples surrounded him, which is in some ways symbolic of a resurrection, the idea of rising up. And then, of course, Paul returned to the city as Jesus went back to Jerusalem to the upper room after his resurrection. Now, I point all this out to you because there's a connection again back in Galatians 3. And flip back with me to Galatians 3, and I'll show you how this is really a demonstration of Jesus' crucifixion and why I, why I would make that point. This is where the study of, of Acts becomes very interesting as a historical background to the rest of our Bible. Galatians chapter 3. You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. Now let me ask you something. How would these Galatians have seen the crucifixion of Jesus Christ? They saw it in the life of Paul. They saw Paul preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, him crucified, dead and buried, and then they witnessed the life of Paul in the story of Jesus Christ. Paul didn't just teach Jesus Christ crucified. He demonstrated it in the reality of his experience. And you also have this example in Acts 14 about the stoning of Paul coming up in various parts of the letter where he talks about he bears in his body, actually in Galatians, he bears in his body the marks of Jesus Christ. You can imagine stoning and how it would cause uh, scars, similar to the idea of scars in Jesus Christ. It, It also parallels very nicely to what took place with Jesus and what took place with Paul with these Gentiles. Well, it doesn't stop with Paul, for we are all called to take up our cross and follow Jesus Christ, our Lord. Sometimes this may lead to danger. When we realize the story of the Bible and the standing and confronting idolatry, we will see that it's a very dangerous calling. And there may be some danger involved when we stand against the idols of our day as well. I also want to point out the other side as well, because there are other stories where the men of God stand against idols and yet they are protected. So there's no reason to get fatalistic about this and say, if I stand against the idols, I'm doomed to die. Because actually there are other examples where God's people stand against idols and God delivers and protects them. Think about the three Hebrews in Babylon who were called to bow down before the image of Nebuchadnezzar. They were called to bow down before the image of gold, and they knew that it very well may mean their death in refusing to participate in that idolatry. In fact, they said, they said to Nebuchadnezzar, you know, our God is capable of saving us, but if he doesn't, we still won't do it. We still won't bow down to the idol. Of course, what happened? Those three men were saved out of the fiery furnace, and they were blessed in the kingdom, and God demonstrated a great deliverance and protection of safety. So not every case of standing against idols is dangerous, in a sense. In fact, if you think about it in the bigger concept of the eternal life that we have in, inside of us, there is no standing against idols that is dangerous. It's actually idol worship itself which becomes dangerous because God destroys all the wicked. God destroys all the wicked who worship idols. So if you think about it from the perspective of the gospel, what we believe about the eternal life that we have, the very most safe thing we can do, even if it means a dangerous lifestyle, is to confront the idolatries around us. We too, whether we face danger or are protected from bodily harm, will magnify God's power and strength when we stand against the idols of our day. Continuing our text in verse 21 of Acts 14. They preached the good news in that city and won a large number of disciples. Then they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true to the faith. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God, they said. Paul and Barnabas appointed elders for them in each church and with prayer and fasting committed them to the Lord in all whom they had put their trust. After going through Pisidia, they came into Pamphylia and when they had preached the word in Perga, they went down to Atalia. From Atalia, they sailed back to Antioch where they had been committed to the grace of God for the work they had now completed. On arriving there, they gathered at the church together and reported all God had done through them and how he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. And they stayed there a long time with the disciples. What you have going on here is the retracing their steps throughout this gospel mission. They're going back to the same places where they first began the mission and they're strengthening the disciples Notice he says that we must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. And I would, I would stress that this is particular to the audience that he was speaking to because we know about the history of this time period. 
We know what Jesus had promised about this time period, and so did Paul. And so when we look, go through this text, we have to be careful to remember what's going on in this time period before we directly apply this. We may have very difficult trials as we live in God's kingdom, but also we may be prospered by God's grace as well, and we may live comfortable lives standing against idols. We really don't know what our future is. They set up each church to function in the lives of the people as they lived out the gospel. Elders were chosen and dedicated to their mission. And then Paul and Barnabas set sail back to Antioch of Syria where they originally set out from. And so you have this big loop forward and backwards going back to Antioch of Syria. Their mission was finished. They rejoiced with their brothers and sisters and spoke of the great things God had done for them. They didn't keep their experience to themselves, did they? They go back to the church in Antioch and report everything to the entire congregation. So when we go out as disciples of Jesus and oppose the idolatry around us for the love of God, it is good for us to share our experiences with our community. The last step in gospel proclamation is rejoicing together in what God has done for us. Let's pray.